I am pregnant, but Emperor Changping is not pleased, despite having no heirs. At 26, Emperor Changping is in his prime for siring offspring. Yet, despite his efforts, not a single concubine has borne him a child. Rumors about the emperor's infertility have spread through the palace and court, despite efforts to suppress them. So my pregnancy conveniently shattered these damaging rumors. But that was all it did. From the moment I became pregnant, disasters plagued the empire, droughts in Shangxi, floods in Zhujiang, pestilence in the northeast, a breach in the Yellow River, and landslides. The imperial astrologers declared that my unborn child was a reincarnation of a calamity star, and I couldn't deny it. I was originally a lowly palace maid, responsible for cleaning the imperial study, a cushy job by many standards. Working under the emperor's nose, one might catch his eye and rise from a maid to a lady of rank. Many senior maids served with this hope. There were precedents. Those with some charm might catch the emperor's eye and become one of his concubines, rising in status and escaping servitude. I was an exception. For a year, eight months, and five days, I worked in the same position without catching the emperor's eye. So it was a surprise even to me when I ended up sleeping with Emperor Changping. I always insisted it was a coincidence. One night, under a sparse moon and stars, I encountered a slightly drunk Emperor Changping in the Imperial Garden. In his inebriated state, he mistook my curvy figure for that of a beauty, and one thing led to another. Most people believed it was a calculated move on my part. Especially since, unlike the usual practice, Emperor Changping did not bestow any titles on me after that night. Even Liang Gong Gong, who asked if the incident should be recorded, was punished with three months salary cut. I returned to my role in the imperial study, mocked by many for my failed attempt at social climbing. However, my ancestors must have blessed me, for I conceived from that one encounter. For the sake of the child, Emperor Changping reluctantly granted me the title of idol consort. At the council discussing my unborn child's fate, Lady Jin sneered, Idol consort is indeed lucky, meeting the emperor in the vast garden at night. If it were daytime, would you have been so fortunate? Lady Jeanne's repeated use of idol consort was grating. Her veiled insults about my looks made the other concubines giggle. Fortunately, I valued my character over my appearance and sat calmly, knowing that higher authorities' decisions were paramount. Regardless of the child's fate, it was still the emperor's child. The idol consort's child must not be kept, Lady Jin advised. Emperor, disasters have struck since her pregnancy. It's an ill omen. Yes, Emperor, for the sake of the state, this child must not be kept. The other concubines can bear children in the future. Emperor Changping remained impassive, his mysterious demeanor enhanced from the throne. I am tired. We will discuss this later, he said nonchalantly after listening to his wives. I have my own plan. I was anxious, fearing a crueler fate awaited. And I was right. The emperor was not moved by fatherly instincts. He was a dragon. Eunuch Liang brought the decree. My child was a calamity star, an evil that could not be allowed to live. Thus, despite his mercy, the emperor ordered the thousand-foot torture to ensure the evil's end. Eunuch Liang tried to comfort me. Endure this, and you'll have a life of luxury. He overestimated me. No woman had ever survived the thousand-foot torture. I recalled the imperial astrologers once warning that Miaoga from Tsuayu Pavilion had offended the deities, endangering the elderly consorts. Emperor Changping laughed at the report. These old fools must be influenced by someone, he said, asking me, do you believe this? My reply was flawless. If you believe it, it's true. If not, it's false. Your Majesty's judgment is what matters. He was pleased with my answer. He never believed in such superstitions, but sometimes let the concubines indulge in them. Now, with the target on me and my child, it was clear we were dispensable and unworthy of saving. It is said that in the previous dynasty, a disfavored consort, driven by loneliness, secretly conceived a child with a guard. When this scandal was uncovered, Empress Su, determined to rectify the palace's moral conduct, 
ordered the consort to be bound and subjected to the thousand-foot torture, where 500 palace maids and 500 eunuchs trampled over her, forcing her to miscarry the four-month-old fetus. The gruesome decree terrified me into illness, proving that, despite everything, I was still a fragile woman. I fell into a feverish delirium and had whimsical dreams. I dreamt of a handsome young man in white galloping on horseback, while I waited desperately at the end of the road for promises he could never fulfill. He said he would protect me no matter what. He said my smile was worth more than the vast expanse of the empire. I also dreamt of the consort who suffered the thousand-foot torture, groping in the blood for her already formed child, cursing loudly, Empress, you will surely face retribution. Blood dripped from her fingers, and the mangled infant was brought before my eyes. I awoke in a daze, seeing the white-clad youth with a gentle smile, like a spring breeze. But I was not fond of such sentimental scenes and decisively slapped him. My fevered hand felt the coolness of his skin, making me want to slap him again for comfort. But someone pushed me hard, making me crash into the bedpost and fall back into unconsciousness. Which heartless bastard dared to be so unkind? I swore to seek revenge. Though I was ugly and lowly, fitting the description of someone who could be easily crushed like an ant, an ant's strength should not be underestimated. Minister Li of the Ministry of War was scolded harshly by Emperor Chongqing and, in his fury, bumped into me in the corridor outside the Imperial Study. He kicked me, breaking my ribs, leaving me bedridden for ten days. Once, when Minister Li went to meet Emperor Chongqing, his boots were covered in dog feces, causing the Emperor to despise him, leading to his career's downfall. Another time, Noble Lady Lu from the side palace sent sweet soup to the Imperial study, but wasn't summoned. Ordered to deliver the message, she blamed me for spilling the soup and slapped me. Later, she was summoned to serve the Emperor but couldn't stop farting, an embarrassing display that demoted her to a minor concubine. My schemes were secretive, but one day I was caught. I had just altered the guard's duty roster and was cleaning up the paper scraps when Emperor Chongping, engrossed in his documents, casually asked, Why didn't you retaliate when Consort Hui spat in your face the other day? His words struck me like a bolt from the blue. I had forgotten that Emperor Chongping, the ruler of the city, had countless eyes watching over the land, and my petty tricks could not escape his divine gaze. I glanced at the Emperor's expression, seeing nothing amiss, and replied honestly, Consort Hui is favored by your majesty, dazzling the harem. Even if she fell flat on her face, your majesty would still love her. How could a mere servant like me challenge her? Emperor Chongping raised an eyebrow, walked over, and said, So, Minister Li, Grand Tutor Lin, Noble Lady Sun, Eunuch Chao, Deputy Minister Gao, Noble Lady Lu, and Lady Ji, you all figured out my displeasure towards them. Sensing my end was near, I dared not argue and count out. Privately, I had to praise myself for understanding the Emperor's preferences better than even his frequent bedmates. So, those who bullied me, if they were disliked or indifferent to the Emperor, I would act against them, which was my secret to repeated success. Emperor Chongping added, You are very clever. I felt no joy in his compliment, knowing that emperors disliked overly clever people, especially those who presumed to understand their thoughts. I wanted to kowtow until I bled to show my repentance, but my thick skin prevented any blood from appearing. Emperor Chongping pressed my shoulder and said, but Consort Hui has become increasingly reckless and troublesome. With a sigh, he left without asking me to rise. I stayed prostrate on the ground, not daring to move until his footsteps faded. Reflecting on the Emperor's words, I sensed a shameless hint. Soon after, Consort Hui spilled hot tea on Emperor Chongping, leading to her being cold-shouldered despite not being demoted. This marked my first collaboration with Emperor Chongping. He often sighed mournfully before me, saying, So-and-so is truly stubborn, loyal but frustrating. His hypocrisy impressed me. In plain terms, Emperor Chongping meant, deal with those old ministers, but don't kill them. I was ashamed of myself for deciphering his hints. 
My cleverness made me useful to Emperor Changping, and he frequently collaborated with me, developing a mutual understanding. He often praised me, you are indeed my confidant. Occasionally, I would indulge myself by eating his snacks or reading his books without permission, and he would turn a blind eye. If others reprimanded me, he would simply give those items to me. This was a blatant display of revolutionary camaraderie. In my dream, I reminisced about my friendship with Emperor Changping. It was these little moments that made me hold a bit of hope for him. But he dashed that hope, sentencing me to the thousand-foot torture, trampling on my dignity. The rage surged through me, waking me from my feverish state. The attending female physician was overjoyed, chattering about how the emperor had graciously visited me once, and I had slapped him in return. He probably came to see if I was dead. Soon, news of my awakening was reported. Jean Pin was the first to visit, clearly with ill intentions, saying, Sien Deng should recuperate well, or you might not survive the thousand-foot torture with that bastard in your belly. I sipped the medicinal soup from the physician's hand, instinctively placing my hand over my belly. I didn't have motherly love yet, I simply pitied this little life. A royal child, destined to be a pawn in political struggles. From a young age, I knew that the imperial family was the most heartless. Child, I whispered in a low, inciting voice, the one who killed you is your father. Don't spare him even in death. That night, I experienced severe abdominal pain, soon followed by a heavy bleeding, resulting in a miscarriage. Emperor Chongfeng was furious and ordered a thorough investigation of the harem. The previous physician was locked up and a new one, Physician Ding, tried to comfort me, saying, Don't be sad, the emperor will surely bring you justice. Sadness? Hardly. This child wouldn't have survived anyway. Losing it this way was much better than facing the thousand-foot torture. Emperor Chongping's fury was expected. Perhaps he believed that, even in death, his child shouldn't go this way. The harem was thrown into chaos. Anyone who had contact with me was detained for questioning, creating a climate of fear. I was able to get out of bed, and Physician Ding took good care of me, often reminding me, be careful not to catch a cold, or it might affect your future fertility. I thought it might be better to become infertile, avoiding so much trouble. For some reason, I frequently dreamt of the young man in white, his eyes and brows filled with endless gentleness. Wiping sweat, feeding me water, tucking me in, or just gazing at me, my dreams were filled with his kindness. Sometimes, I couldn't distinguish between dreams and reality, feeling warmth in my hands as if he had held them. I suspected I was having nightmares. To me, no matter how wonderful the dream was, if it involved the young man in white, it was a nightmare. Physician Ding noticed my poor complexion and asked, you've been looking unwell lately. I told her, I've been dreaming of a big-tailed wolf frequently. It must be a nightmare. Coincidentally, a wooden doll pierced with needles was unearthed in Jean Pin's garden, inscribed with my birth date. Her maid confessed to adding abortifacients to my medicine under orders. With irrefutable evidence, numerous abortifacients were found under Jean Pin's bed, clearly aged and unused for a long time. With the culprit identified, Emperor Chongping visited my humble abode for the first time. He asked, how do you want to deal with Jin Pin? I was stunned, not expecting to have a say in this matter. There was a fleeting guilt and remorse in his eyes. I thought he needn't feel this way. We merely shared a bed once. Our relationship was not that deep. Naturally, I wasn't one to overestimate my importance. I responded graciously. I leave it to your majesty's judgment. Perhaps he was momentarily irrational, as he decreed the next day, Zhen Pin, guilty of harming a royal offspring, was stripped of her title and given three feet of white silk to end her life. Emperor Chongping forgot that Jin Pin was not to be underestimated. She had a brother commanding significant military power, whose discontent could unsettle the court. Sure enough, General Jin stationed 50,000 soldiers outside the city without orders, causing widespread panic, with rumors of rebellion. The capital was enveloped in tension. Ironically, I, I was the only one leisurely strolling in the garden. I told Physician Ding, if the city falls, 
the blooming flowers here will all be in vain. Physician Ding timidly avoided replying. I smiled and, as I turned, a black feathered arrow shot through the air. Amidst screams, the arrow pierced my abdomen, blood gushing out. The assassin fled, clearly familiar with the palace layout. I suddenly realized that all along, the repeated assassination attempts were not aimed at Emperor Chongping, but at me. Since entering the palace, assassins have appeared sporadically. Dressed in night attire, armed with black feathered arrows, these assassins were marked by these traits. The most frequent words I heard from Eunuch Liang beside Emperor Chongping were, protect the emperor, there's an assassin. Anyone would think the assassins were targeting Emperor Chongping, right? But who would have thought that their actual target was me? I remember one time encountering an assassin, embodying a self-sacrificing spirit, I took an arrow meant for Emperor Chongping. The injury was on my shoulder, not life-threatening, yet in my days, I seemed to hear Emperor Chongping anxiously calling out, Ah Xian, behind me. I thought I misheard, but now I realize that Ah Xian indeed came from his mouth. Turns out, the identity I had always kept hidden, thinking no one knew, had long been exposed. I am the eldest princess of the former dynasty. Empress Su, who invented the thousand-foot torture, was my mother. I was once the most beloved, the most noble princess of the kingdom, until General Wei Yuan suddenly rebelled, surrounding the imperial city with 100,000 elite troops, forcing the emperor to abdicate. Emperor Chongping, Morong Jian, was General Wei Yuan's most favored son. Before this, he was my childhood sweetheart, accompanying me throughout my childhood. In my eyes, even the most noble lineage couldn't compare to a single finger of Morong Jian. At the grand banquet for my coming-of-age ceremony, my father betrothed me to Morong Jian. He, dressed in white, knelt on one knee, loudly thanking the emperor. I saw in his eyes a genuine joy. I thought I could finally fulfill my childhood promise. Brother Jian will always be together. At that time, General Wei Yuan's power overshadowed the emperor and my father sought to win him over by marrying me off. I always thought there wasn't another princess, as understanding as I was. My father, the emperor, was lecherous and extravagant, neglecting governance for pleasure. If one day he was overthrown, I wouldn't be surprised at all. But I didn't expect that person to be Murong Jian and his father although I tried to understand. I understood the rise and fall of dynasties. I understood the people's heart. I understood that rebellions and grievances didn't arise overnight. I just didn't understand when this play had started. Were all those sweet words and vows of love just empty promises? Was everything a mirage? No, it wasn't, he said, holding my hand firmly. Ah, Sien, my feelings for you were always true. Murong Jian arranged for guards to escort me south out of the palace. He said, no matter what happens, I'll protect you. He said, a thousand miles of rivers and mountains cannot compare to your smile. He said, ah Xian, wait for me. I waited joyfully, but what came were soldiers sent to eliminate me. They said, Princess ah Xian, the young lord will not come. The remnants of the previous dynasty cannot be left alive. Although I wasn't a saint, the royal family had an ironclad dignity. I leapt off a thousand-foot cliff, preferring death over capture. I imagine the heroic tale of the former dynasty's eldest princess, a paragon of virtue, dies heroically, would be told for generations. Unexpectedly, I didn't die, a few of my father's old retainers saved me. These old men truly didn't know any better. Though I survived, my face was disfigured beyond recognition. First, they acknowledged my bearing, then gave me a new face. I became an unremarkable girl. I wanted to live a simple life under a humble identity. But the loyal ministers wouldn't allow such thoughts of cowardly survival. Their mission was to make me a vengeful princess. They suspected I still had feelings for Morong Jian, but little did they know that as I dragged my battered body from the brink of death, I had already banished Morong Jian from my world. I neither wanted to hate him nor resent him, just to live separate lives from now on. But royal children never have control over their own lives. Under their arrangement, I entered the palace as an honored laborer. Emperor Chongping, 
in his prime, had numerous concubines but few offspring, not for lack of effort. As the maid responsible for cleaning the imperial study, I couldn't waste such a good position. The ink emperor Changping used daily was no longer just ink. I added a little spice to it. Emperor Changping, diligent in his duties, spent most of his time in the imperial study. The spice had long permeated his body. If his concubines ever conceived, it would certainly be an affair. In the past, my mother used this substance on my father. Out of 36 consorts, only she bore children. Now I could regret on her behalf. If my father had more sons, I wouldn't be the one fighting now. Only my mother had the antidote. When she handed me the spice and antidote, she said, Child, you'll need this someday. I thought I'd never use it, but life is full of surprises. Just like I didn't foresee Morong Jian and I ending up like this. I told the loyal ministers, Morong Jian will never have children in his lifetime. You just have to outlive him, and the restoration of the dynasty is imminent. But the old men found this plan unfeasible, fearing they might die first. They suggested, seize the chance to sleep with Emperor Changping a few times, have a child with our royal blood to inherit his throne, and that counts as a roundabout way to restore the kingdom. Although the old men secretly plotted to kill Morong Jian and control the young emperor once the child was born, at least we finally had a unified strategy. I want to have a child, a child between Morong Jian and me. In our youth, Morong Jian said, if it's a girl, her name will be Xianqing. If it's a boy, his name will be Xianyi. I had a different idea. If it's a girl, her name will be Jianjia. If it's a boy, his name will be Jiandan. We often argued over this, settling it with drinking contests and martial arts duels. I fantasized about the appearance of that child. A fair face, with Morong Jian's deep, handsome eyes and well-defined nose, my slender eyebrows, and cherry lips. Now, I don't know if with ulterior motives, scheming to have a child with Morong Jian, heaven will allow this child to be as angelic as I imagine. But I have no choice. I must conceive Morong Jian's child. Yet, successfully sleeping with Emperor Changping was not easy. For palace maids and eunuchs secretly called Emperor Changping a romantic fool. When I first entered the palace, I heard rumors that he was deeply in love with the late princess A Xian of the previous dynasty, often staring at her portrait to alleviate his longing. He gathered beauties who bore some resemblance to the princess, even maintaining the princess's bedchamber exactly as it was, without moving anything. I suspected this was Emperor Changping's self-flattery. Apart from anything else, the fact that the bedchamber remained unchanged was a lie. I couldn't believe the chamber pot I used at midnight would still be there. I also didn't see any resemblance between the concubines in the palace and myself. At the time, I was smug, thinking there was an opportunity. I wore the clothes we once sneaked out of the palace in, styled my hair in the idle flower bun he invented, and flaunted myself in front of him eight times a day without him giving me a single glance. Even if my face had changed, my figure and bearing should have sparked some recognition, right? I thought, Morong Jian had long forgotten Princess A Xian. Especially after forming a cooperative relationship, Morong Jian would occasionally share heartfelt stories with me. Whenever he recounted the tale of a general's son falling in love with a princess while slightly drunk on the rooftop, I really wanted to kick him off. I endured. My endurance finally paid off, but I didn't expect that regardless of whether this child was an angel or a demon, I wouldn't have the chance to give birth. My child died, and I am close to death. Asien, Asien. Emperor Changping called out beside me, oblivious to his own fate. I couldn't open my eyes. The imperial physician said the arrow was poisoned, and the poison had spread to my heart, beyond cure. I thought sacrificing my child was the end, but it turns out I still had my life to lose. Emperor Chongping raged, if anything happens to her, none of you will live. So touching, I almost believed I was a favored concubine of the emperor. I thought if I died, I would join my child who had become a ghost, and together we would sing every night, scaring Morong Jian to death. Then I heard someone speaking earnestly and persuasively, 
Your Majesty, you have spoiled her too much, or how else could today's disaster have occurred? Was this about me? What a joke. Cutting weeds without removing the roots will see them grow again with the spring breeze. Back then, your majesty spared her out of old affection, but today we cannot continue to show mercy. General Zhen has stated clearly that if you hand over concubine Xian, he will immediately withdraw his troops. The general is actually loyal to your majesty, but his sister died unjustly, and your majesty has been deceived by a witch. He committed this grave offense in a moment of anger. I hope your majesty understands. I desperately wanted to hear more, but the room fell into a long silence. I panicked. Wouldn't Morong Jian consider handing me over? On second thought, with his character, it's not impossible. I have failed her once. I will never let it happen again. After a long time, I heard this sigh, almost unable to believe my ears. The helplessness and determination in his words made my eyes sting, and tears rolled down my cheeks. Your Majesty, the concubine is crying, said Ding Yin. A gentle finger wiped away the tears, his breath warm on my face. Ah Xian, you heard me, didn't you? Were you desperate when you waited for me in Jiangnan and I never came? I didn't betray you. I was surrounded by my father's guards, unable to escape. When I finally arrived, all I found was your embroidered shoe by the cliff. I thought you were dead, and I wanted to die with you. But at that moment, my father killed himself in front of me. He said he couldn't stop me, but he hoped I would remember that a country cannot be without a ruler for a day. Asien, these years, I have borne so much, not a single day of happiness. I only felt a heat in my chest, a metallic taste in my mouth, and in a daze, coughed up blood. It hurts so much. Ding Yin cried, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, stop talking, or the concubine will die from the pain. The ministers also said, Your Majesty, bloodshed is inevitable in a dynastic change. You are not at fault. Murong Jian's voice suddenly turned sharp. I know you have been secretly sending assassins after her, so I kept her by my side, hoping she would be safe under my watch. But I didn't expect you to have the audacity to not only target my child but also harm her right in front of me. The old minister is loyal to the emperor and the country, willing to die a thousand times. Your majesty's mercy, the thousand foot torture, was just a temporary measure to appease us. But this child cannot be born, for he would become a threat to the throne. If your majesty wants to blame, I have no words. Indeed, I wanted to eliminate this child, but I did not expect someone to act before me. My heart suddenly tightened, tearing apart painfully. I thought, with these cruel truths exposed, there is no longer any possibility between Morong Jian and me. Did your majesty never suspect? The entire palace believes that concubine Xian is about to undergo the thousand-foot torture. In their eyes, it would be a spectacle of one death, two lives. Who would be foolish enough to give her an abortive medicine at this time? Yes, it was I who framed Jin concubine. I am the murderer of my own child. I had no other choice. She miscarried on her own, framed Jin concubine, and forced General Zhen to rebel. Every step was meticulously planned. Yes, using a borrowed knife to kill, the best strategy. What wrong did she do? She witnessed the horrific death of a pregnant woman under the thousand-foot torture. Believing she would surely die, she resorted to such measures. In the end, it's my fault. She no longer believes I can protect her. Your Majesty, even if General Zhen breaches the city, I will never hand over Asien. Your Majesty, please reconsider. Morong Jian shouted sternly, Remember this, if she lives, I live. If she dies, I die. Your Majesty, the Imperial Physicians have said there is no cure for this poison. Is that so? Morong Jian had just spoken when I heard a muffled groan. From the chaotic screams, I realized that Morong Jian had cut his arm with the poisoned arrow. I thought my plan was foolproof. General Zhen's army approaches the city, I seize the opportunity to leave the palace. When Murong Jian can't hand me over, General Zhen, enraged, orders an attack on the city. No matter the outcome, both armies will suffer great losses. 
Then, we would have an opportunity. Only, I miscalculated one thing. Morong Jian never intended to hand me over. In a daze, the vows of the past surged in my heart, not seeking to be born on the same day of the same month of the same year, but to die on the same day of the same month of the same year. The sound of kneeling echoed around me, one person sobbing, I dare not deceive your majesty. To eliminate future troubles, this poison indeed has no cure. At this moment, all I could think about was wanting to poke Morong Jian's temple and scold him. Fool. Great, now coercion has failed, and instead, he risks his own life. If I could jump up, I would definitely slap him. The bed sank as he lay beside me, holding my hand. If there is no antidote, then announce the death of both of us. He was calm, but I was not. Just like that? Just I like that? One of us is an emperor, the other a princess. With such important identities, we cannot die so easily. We didn't die. Morong Jian's loyalists were determined to kill me, but he had long ago sent someone to strangle the assassin, secretly replacing him with his own loyal soldier, staging an assassination attempt on me in the Imperial Garden. Now, during the national mourning period, the carriage heading south was draped in mourning white, swaying along the way. In the carriage, Morong Jian smiled at me. Princess Asian is dead, and no one will force you to restore the previous dynasty. And in this world, there is no more Emperor Chongping. I looked outside the carriage at the bright sunlight and falling flowers, none as radiant as his smile. He truly did it, proving that the vast land was nothing compared to seeing Asian smile. Occasionally, we had conversations like this. When did you discover my identity? When you survived the cliff fall, I was the first to find out. So I notified your father's old subordinates to come and rescue you. Since then, you've always had my secret guards by your side. Damn. It turns out I had been discovered a long time ago.